Many of you may never have heard of the Viking mission to Mars, especially you and the younger generation. But in 1976, NASA landed two of the most complex spacecraft ever launched on the surface of Mars. I happened to have had an experiment aboard one of those. The whole mission was dedicated towards the search for life on Mars, and my experiment was one of those that was a light detector. It was called the Labeled Release Experiment, and I believe it did indeed find life on Mars. However, I'm going to tell you the tale of how this was not widely accepted. The 34-year fight I've had to have it accepted, where the situation stands now, and what I think we ought to do. My trip along the yellow brick road that went 440 million miles to Mars started on the yellow sands of Santa Monica Beach in California. There, as a public health engineer for the state of California, I was taking samples of seawater to have them analyzed for bacteria to see whether people could swim safely in the seawater. Much of the sewage from Los Angeles was being dumped at that time right into Santa Monica Bay, right where people were swimming. What bothered me about this was that after I took the sample, took it back to the laboratory, it took three or four days for the analyses and sometimes as long as a week for the reports to come back to me telling me what the status of the water was. On the basis of that, I was to quarantine or not quarantine stretches of the beach. Obviously, anyone could see that by the time the results came back, thousands of people had gone bathing in the water and the results were of historic interest only. This did frustrate me. I went back to the District of Columbia, changing my jobs, where I worked for the D.C. Department of Public Health, and again, I was responsible for microbiological quality of water, this time much more serious than just bathing water, but drinking water for the entire municipality. Every day I sent sanitarians out to sample taps from distant parts of the city, bring them back to the laboratory for analysis, but alas, again, it was up to a week before we got results and a million or so people had consumed the water by then. One day, the thought occurred to me that perhaps a simple modification of the standard method for analyzing water for microorganisms could speed the whole process up. The standard method consists of taking a sample suspected of containing microorganisms and placing a part of it into test tubes containing nutrient broths to grow the microorganisms. If indeed they grew, they would produce eventually bubbles which could be seen. These took one, two, three, four days before you could tell that there was something growing in the broth. What occurred to me was the use of radioisotopic carbon instead of plain old nutrients. I had some radioisotopic carbon nutrient made and I tested this in the standard method and I found that I could detect the microorganisms in a very short period of time. Well, in order to do this, however, I had first to make a proposal to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, win a small grant from them, then convince my boss, the head of the Department of Public Health, to take me to Georgetown University Med School where the Department of Biochemistry welcomed the opportunity to have me devote one day a week in their laboratory to developing this method. As I just indicated, the method developed very quickly and successfully so that within a couple of months it was obvious that a new method was available that could detect as few as 10 microorganisms and could make the detection in record time of half hour, one hour, couple of hours at the most. 
So here was a way that we could tell in real time whether water was contaminated or not, be it bathing water, drinking water, swimming water, whatever. As a result, I wrote and published a couple of papers outlining this procedure, hoping that public health departments across the nation would adopt it. Alas, they did not. Why? Because in those days, radioisotopes was a bad word. People were scared of anything that was radioactive. Even though, by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission standards, I could drink tap water with as much of the radioisotope in it as was required for the test. So it was really a very tiny amount. Nonetheless, the word was enough to warn people away. So, again, I was quite frustrated in that the states, barring one or two, did not adapt the method to their procedures. Well, one Christmas Eve, I found myself at a party where I was fortunate enough to bump into Dr. Keith Glennon, the first administrator of the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. During the course of the evening, I had a conversation with him, and I asked him whether NASA ever intended to look for life on Mars. He said, oh yes we do. He said, as a matter of fact, I just hired a man to head up a biology department to do that. I said, oh, isn't that interesting? I have a method that I think might work on Mars. He said, well, if you do, why don't you go down and speak to this man, Dr. Clark Rand. I said, gee, I'd love to do that. And he gave me Dr. Rand's number. I called him up the next work day. He invited me down. I described the method to him. He said, hey, that sounds great. We are just funding methods to look for life on other planets. We have only one other method so far funded. So write a proposal. I did write a proposal, and then I learned something about the government. It takes time. After my proposal was submitted, I waited a year before I found out one day by a letter that it was accepted. So here I was now funded in a little company that I had started to undertake a research program to develop the technique from that for drinking water to one to look for life on Mars. It was very exciting. 